This is my best friend Nick. He survived the equivalent of Navy SEAL training in our country Cyprus, where over 200 people signed up, but only 13 were able to complete it. He goes deep about many things from the training that have never been shared before. Nick, you did one of the most difficult trainings in the world called Navy SEAL. Why you decided to go there? So I decided to do the Navy SEALs with Phidias when I was 18 because I wanted to prove myself to my father. And I also wanted to do it for my mind. So essentially I wanted to do something very difficult. So knowing that I could do that, I can do anything else that I want in life. So prove your worth to your father, you say. Yeah, so for me, Growing up, I always wanted to prove to my father that I'm capable, that I can do stuff in life. And growing up, my parents, they wanted me to go a certain route. They wanted me to go to university. And growing up, I had difficulty like deciding what I wanted to do, going to university, not going to university. Actually, I know I knew that I didn't want to go to university. But after the army, after going through all of that, I think that what made me kind of a man and made me make my own decisions in life. So after the army, I was like, okay, I'm able to do this. So I'm able to do anything else. So I was very strong with my decisions. Can you explain to the people like why you did army? Because it like uh, they explained the situation in our country and stuff with the army. Yeah, of course. So in the army, you there's a conscription service. So you have to do 14 months, but during those 14 months, you can choose where to go. So you could choose to go to OIC, which is the equivalent to the Navy SEALs. They take the same training, which is eight months training. And then the rest is basically the rest of your conscription service. It's not training. It's just, uh, well, it's training, but not so intense. The full uh, Navy SEAL training is eight months. So you have the first, second, and third phase, which is leading up to the hell week leading up to the big swim and leading up to the big run. Okay, okay, interesting. Start, uh, we're going to lead into those, explaining about Hell Week, how was it for you and all this stuff later, but tell me more about like uh, how many people they went in the beginning and like how it happened in the, tell me from the beginning. So if I remember correctly, approximately uh, 400 people signed up to go to the Navy SEALs like at least 80% of the people dropped out in the first month and we ended up with 13 students left and 13 students finished the school. So out of 400 people that applied, only 13 people finished. Yeah, that's correct. So ladies and gentlemen, it's not a joke we're talking about. No. We're talking about the uh, a lot, the elite forces and the actually the most capable men in the in that year in our country. So it's a, it's an interesting thing. So start the, uh, uh, just to clarify, I think 400 people signed in for the program. So may, and it, it was physical exercises to see if people can pass to the training and some people didn't make it on the, a lot of people didn't make it on the physical training. So, uh, by the way, I, uh, because I'm, I'm like talking from authority here, yeah? <laughs> and I was a Navy SEAL as well. So this is where I, I met yeah. Nick. Phidias and I were actually in the army together. That's where we met. So it's one of the reasons why I'm very grateful for choosing to do the army and choosing to go to the Navy SEALs. And uh, yeah, Phidias and I, we actually swam 14 kilometers. We were partners in the big swim. So we swam for seven and a half hours in the sea. And uh, that was an interesting experience. Yeah, because like, if you think about it, like all you are going to find your friends and like the most capable people, not in everyday life, most uh, most likely you are going to find them in these groups. Like for example, uh, it's in these groups of the best, whatever men uh, of the country in the military, you're going to find a lot of people similar to you and make friendships. So it was not everyone that were out of our 13 people that we finished, that we were able to connect and stuff, but we had similar mindset and all this stuff. But day one, you probably scared of the everything. 
So how everything happened, like day one, going to the Navy SEALs, you know that there is eight months of training. Explain me your emotions, like how it progressed and all these things. So for me, there was a lot of uncertainty because as a English speaker raised and born in England, I didn't really know that much about OIC. I just knew it was similar to the Navy SEALs and that's the training that I wanted to do. So the specifics of OIC itself, I didn't really... Um, understand that much so I took it day by day whether that's a good thing psychologically or not that's up to you to decide I can only say from my experience so day by day I learned new and new things which would come off the training so in general it was a very interesting experience probably one of the most interesting experiences of my life day by day what you mean so you you, you just thought okay let's finish this day and nothing else matter like this is what you mean I uh, pretty much took it every taking everything new every day so i didn't know what was to come of the training i didn't really know uh of the difficulties that would come but yeah i took every day as just a new day and i only thought that i would be able to quit on the weekend or when we would go home or so essentially yeah explain that like we're talking about like a very hard thing. So you're going in the week and everyone thinks, oh, I will give up or something, all, all this stuff. And why? And you put a rule for the week and explain that a bit more. Yeah, so essentially they try to find your breaking point and that's why there's a high dropout rate, especially in the first month where they try to get everyone out. So I set a rule for myself that I'm not able to quit whilst in the training because then it will be only an emotional response. But essentially they try to get in your head, try to get in your mind to want to be able to quit and i think everyone has a did, breaking point did you ever got close to uh, like uh, quitting and that saying that i will only quit on the weekend by the way on the weekend guys we were off so we were going home on the weekend so that's why he put that rule so did you ever close get close to quitting so for me i definitely had a breaking point um it wasn't it so the, the, the breaking point that happened probably towards the beginning of the training, everyone was telling me that I couldn't complete the training because I didn't speak that much Greek. Very important. Let me emphasize that. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick came, we're, to, we're in Cyprus. Cyprus is a Greek speaking language and Nick knew kind of not, no Greek. So he didn't speak the language. He was able to complete the Navy SEAL uh, course without talking the language, which is crazy. I admire Nick so much. It's like he was 10 times probably more stronger than all of us that we knew Greek because it's different to know the language and understand that this is a mental game and it's different for everyone, even the trainers, even the students, thinking that this guy has no chance. Like you could, we had, tests to sign, uh, to make uh, tests. Yeah, all the tests were in Greek. So he was able in like eight months to learn the language and to be or do good on tests, to do on average uh, uh, the test. So it's, it, I'm talking like really from the bottom of my heart, like if I was in Nick's position and not knowing Greek, I'm not sure if I was going to finish the thing because everyone, explain, everyone. I mean, it's a very weird scenario because I'm the, I'm the only, I'm, I'm kind of an outcast, an underdog. I think all the trainers and all the other students, they, I was the least expected to pass. Everyone, everyone didn't think that I would, I would pass at all. Not only because it's up to me, but it's also like logistically because we're going to be learning about bombs. We're going to be learning about uh, diving, advanced diving. So a lot of those things are are difficult. So to learn the language whilst in the army, it's it's quite a strange task, a very odd task. How did you feel ev that everyone around you knew the language and were more comfortable? Did you feel that you were on a disadvantage, on an advantage? Like I mean, I definitely felt like an, at a disadvantage. I felt that the attention was mainly on me. So, some people, by the way, say that maybe Nick's job was more easier because he didn't understand the mental training. But I want to, but 
uh, I'm sure the trainers made you some mental training English as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. I think there was a lot of um, a lot of focus on me and a lot of times. Perhaps not with all trainers, but uh, I think towards the beginning there was a lot of focus towards me, and then. I guess once you pass a certain level, then there's a certain level of respect. So yeah, after the first phase, after two three months, they are like, okay, he's probably going to stay. And I want to say that after the army, guys, <laughs> after we finish, a new rule came in place. You are not allowed to go to Navy Seals if you don't know Greek. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the first and last in my country to have done that. <laughs> yes. So, but. Let's talk a bit about more of the training. Like, okay, you went there and like people started leaving, quitting. Like, how was going there? What did you expect? What did you find? And all these things. So going there, I'm not sure exactly. I'm not sure exactly what I expected. I actually didn't expect anything. Um, I was definitely. It was definitely difficult. I mean, you can imagine it's difficult, but being there, doing the scenario, I think. This whole training makes you understand your limits, actually, because you would never expect your limits to be that that far. And then, of course, the trainers are pushing you, and that's part of the training. So it definitely made me understand my physical limits. So I remember you you asked me about my breaking point. So I remember for me, it was that my body just couldn't give anymore. I was so, so exhausted, so tired. And my my whole like physically, I couldn't I couldn't give anymore. And I went to the doctors, and they were, the doctors were like confused. They were because they took my blood test, and it was as if um, it was as if like I was dying or something because it was it was super weird. All my my levels were super low, and I think that was that was a breaking point for me. But I pushed through to that. I followed to my rule that I can only quit on the weekends. And even though that I wanted to come back in and quit on Monday, that's what I thought initially. Um, I calmed my mind down a bit because um, we're we're like as humans we're very emotionally invested in our thoughts. And I rested, and then I thought, okay, I'm gonna put more focus in resting on the weekends because I think I didn't do that before. And then with that, I never I never looked back again. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. Like even the people that they gave up, I think like I hear, I listen, you did as well. You listen to the new book of David Goggins and he speaks about that. Yeah. You feel cold or you feel like exhausted and all this stuff. And you go and give up, but then you go to your house to have a shower. And the next day is like, it's like you, it's, your soul is taken away from you because you regret everything. It's like it was one low point. So passing through that like low point is like, and just not breaking at that moment and just say, okay, I will go through this and then I will decide. Maybe that's kind of the secret in a way. Yeah, I think the biggest impact what going through the army has given me is that, okay, it made me understand my limits a lot more, but it makes you understand that okay anything is is possible you can push through almost anything and like now looking back to the army we always like look at the good moments right so even in those times you, where it's, it, you're struggling we look back at the good moments but at the time it was just pain and suffering so perhaps pain and suffering is uh the key to growth the key to uh the key to getting better so that's okay so you a month passed two months passed, like how was the growth on a personal level? Like you were just a kid, like 18, 19 year old. And like, how, how is a kid, 18 year old going through all this stuff? Like what was the sacrifice that you had to make? What was the, I mean, going through the army, it's like, it's like eight months of training where you can only focus on the army. So you got to like cut out your social life. you got to cut out kind of your personality because you're going through a process and it's the only thing that matters. So going through that process and then coming out of the process is a bit weird because you come, you go in as a person and then you come out and you don't know, really know who you are. You have to discover again what you like and the type of person you are. So I think the biggest struggle was how long it was because every day you're thinking, okay, it's, it's cold 
and like it's so long like the the goal is so far but being in the army being with the others being a bit secluded because i was the only one that uh, didn't understand that much greek it kind of made me feel uh, isolated in a way so i think i got growth from that what do you mean isolated like ah oh. You, and explain the situation like with the Greek people and like you were, because I knew the language it was a bit better to make friendships or connect with people inside the army like explain that a bit like so although because I don't understand although in the Navy SEALs you're meant to be a team and we were a team I still felt as though I was a bit isolated from the rest because it's easy for others to make friendships and speak with each other I feel as though I was not the first because I was like the the black sheep It was more difficult to make partnerships. It was more difficult to socialize. And I think in, in that type of scenario, it's like it's good to keep your mind on other things. So for me, I was more in my head, more like to myself. So essentially, I think that's that's the main difference. To What the you others. were thinking, like we had to do a lot of crazy things like running, swimming for countless hours, like do whatever a lot of bad things but what was going through your head all the time that you were going for a run going for a big swim like what you were thinking well, what were other than thinking thoughts? of the pain and suffering that was going on at the time i just had one goal in my head so i wanted to finish i didn't want to i kept thinking about the alternative if i was not to not to pass and how psychology that psychologically that would affect me and how psychologically it has affected other people in the past that you hear stories of. So I was imagining like the alternative. I had dreams waking up that like I had dreams that I was quitting. And then like I was feeling the emotion of like the bad emotion of quitting. You, you can't imagine guys, this is crazy. Like we, we were so afraid of failing. Yeah. That was so big. We're so afraid of failing. I was imagining the look on my father's face if I was to tell him, okay, I quit. So. For me, quitting was not an option. I think it was more painful to quit than to, to But carry But we on. have to say that even if we did everything correctly, it could, it, it was also had some room of failure because some tests you cannot just pass because it's like more than your capabilities. And a lot of soldiers, they were just uh, not as fast in swimming and they were, got cut down so not or some people broke their leg and they couldn't be able to continue and this is natural thing so just having uh, even if you do everything right there is still yeah unfortunately the like towards the second phase there was actually 17 of us not 13 of us and four four of us got cut for the swimming so that's like that's like a big Like a big emotional strain. How, how do you think about these people that they quit? Was that your thoughts? The pe like 400 people you said you know, wanted to sign up. Like probably 100 people made in the training. And like all the other people like that. that. You still speak with some of them. Like you, like how is, how did you think? How do you think of he, uh, this affected them? So... Actually, the interesting thing which I found at the beginning of the training, which I still find interesting, the ones that quit at the beginning. So going into the army, you could, for you, you socialize with others, you saw the characters of other people, and you could kind of like you would kind of predict, oh, this person would stay, this person would not. And the interesting thing was like you can't really see someone beyond how you you see them. Like it's more internally. You see these people, they look very tough. It looks so big and you think, oh, these people are not going to quit. They're better than you. But when it comes down to it, when there's psychological pressure, you see that these people, they mainly have like emotional issues, emotional problems. And that's what makes them try to look more tough. But in reality, they're more weaker internally. So I think that was the main thing. Toughness is within the mind. It does not so much like an appearance. It's crazy, guys. Like you see one short, skinny guy, like making it in the thing. And you see one, the most muscular, the most like look tough. And it's like, it doesn't even matter. Like it's all about the mental thing. So yeah. just seeing this. But like, do you think those people that they quit, they still affects them, enhance them, and they affected their... Their confidence. 
I mean, I hope not. I hope they can look look behind that and try to think otherwise, think that they can succeed in other places in their life. But I think for me, if if that was to happen to me, I think it would have been very detrimental. So I I I, I would say it, if it was me, it would, it would still have a very big effect on me. In what way, you think? I think because if you fail at one, th because you can always say like, I'm the best, I would always do well in everything that I do. But if you fail in, in one thing that was important to you, then psycholog psychologically, subconsciously, you would always think, okay, then I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to do that. The benefit that I got from the army is like, okay, I'm worthy to do many other things. And I think that, I think, I think there is a psychological effect. And I think that's why people, they tend to go back and try again. Because yeah. you can always go back and try again. Yeah, David Goggins think he did it a couple of times. Yeah, three times. Three times, like that must have been a big effect on him. So doing he, three we hell weeks, he had Man. to do it three times, <laughs> and it wasn't even his fault. He got injured. Imagine you go through all that training, you get injured, and then because you can't do the training, you have to do it again. It's like it's such a big psychological stress. So hopefully, people that fail in the that was a big debate in my head. Like, is this? Is it better for the people that will fail to not go or to the Navy SEALs? Or is it better for them just to go for the experience and just learn from it? That was a big debate because it affects your confidence. You know that you are probably not better than the other people or something like that. But I think if you take everything as on YouTube, like as you started making videos as well, it's about failure being comfortable with failure. So if you if you are that that powerful to even take that, I said, okay, it was a failure, I will learn and I will commit more in the future in my next goal and, and focus more. So I think that's, you can't do it, but it's definitely not easy. I mean, 100%, it's good to make mistakes. It's good to have failure, but I think it's important. If you go into the mindset, if you go into the Navy SEALs with the mindset like, oh, I'll try it out. Oh, If, if it doesn't work out, it's okay. Then if you, if you go in with that mindset, then you're, you're, you're doomed to fail because you have to go in thinking there's only one way out. Uh, otherwise you will fail. So perhaps, uh, of course, making mistakes is good. I mean, you're making YouTube videos, you're making hundreds of YouTube videos. Yeah, you're making mistakes, but still with this type of making mistakes, there's an end goal. Like you will, you will succeed no matter what. You're, even though your first thousand videos are terrible, you're still going to keep making videos and eventually they're going to do well for you. Yeah, but it's not the is some, for example, I failed in so many places, like starting some different business, whatever, donkey business or like, or uh, opening a shisha, uh, uh, like, uh, how would say, opening a cafe. And I failed in that place, but that was not my leak kind of. And like failing in different places, it's not, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think for sure it's great to fail. I mean, like, like you said, you created different businesses that kind of like builds the skill of like being an entrepreneur, builds the skill in your mind to eventually succeed in that area. But At the same time, when you decide to do those things, you were all out in them. You were like, okay, you had a vision that it was going to be successful. I agree with you, honestly, because I'm a bit romantic trying to say, oh, it will be okay. Or it will, they, they will have one person that quits Navy SEAL will be okay. But I think probably deep down in their soul, it haunts them for their whole life. It's good to try. It's good to make mistakes, but whatever you do, put all of your energy behind it so you can do well. And, and if you and go I, half and half, then at it will least take you, much longer. Uh, at least your growth do a hundred percent of your effort. So you know that you did everything. I think you, you should do hundred percent in everything that you do in life. Why? Because then you feel, you feel more congruent to what you do. hundred percent in everything, every activity you do. I think it's more fulfilling. Even when you're eating, if you're hundred percent in the process of eating, then you're present <laughs> and you're present to that moment. Okay. So, Hell week, like uh, a lot of people are afraid of hell week. A lot of, this is the most difficult week probably that will be in our life or something. I don't know. We're going to have a tougher week than hell week in our lives. So how was leading uh, up to hell week? And also later I want to ask you about the trainers. 
of the Navy SEAL. How was your relationship with them? If you hated them and all this stuff, but answer about the Hell Week. Hell Week is a big thing for. So Hell Week, I'm super interested in the psychology of the human mind and Hell Week was just a super big, like it was so interesting. Every time I look back and analyze, just ma- just makes me think so much because you don't have any sleep and you're rem- you're trying to think back to how your brain formulated those memories and it's kind of like you don't sleep but you're sleeping in a way where you're walking with a boat on your head and you're still sleeping and like you really try to you, you really understand your limits in hell week because there's there's so much things going on and then when you look back to back to it it's kind of psychedelic I remember I was crying a lot of times in the hell week. I remember I was so emotional, like, it's crazy. Like, everyone was ha- so emotional. I think even as a team, like, everyone was getting mad at each other and stuff because people are not sleeping. They're, like, com- completely, like, completely tired. Can you tired explain the situation, like, what hell week means? Like, uh, what is the physical process that you go through? What is some of the... So it's, it starts at 12 o'clock midnight they you're in your dorm they kick down the door and then they build they, like they they try to bring a sense of panic and essentially there's like sirens everyone's hitting you you have to go outside you have to undergo cer- like certain tasks they they're kicking you you have to do push-ups you have to you have to run you have to go in the water they put you down in the water and Yeah, essentially it's a big state of panic and there's a whole program where throughout the the time until Friday afternoon, you have to be doing exercise, you have to be on the go, you have to be rowing your boat, you have to be carrying the boat on your head, you have to be doing exercises with logs, like wooden logs. So essentially that's, that's the whole process. Also on the Tuesday you have the test of panic where they drown you with your your hands folded and the Wednesday there's a kidnapping that they simulate so you go on a mission how, how did you feel when they kidnap you and they tortured you did you did you know like you were like okay this is everything's kind of fake they're just simulating this or you are you were like okay so for me I think I was I was conscious to that I, I know that of course everything is simulated but um yeah so for me it was a bit different from the others because i i don't think the hell week was maybe the most i don't think the hell week for me was the most difficult part hell week was not the most difficult thing for you so no i don't think hell week was the most difficult part for me it was definitely for me so the hell week was it was very interesting after but like the whole whilst i was in the process of hell week because my i didn't really understand kind i didn't even comprehend what was going on kind of so it was it was kind of like you're always doing something so you're always distracted by doing something so i wouldn't say hell week was the most difficult for me um the days kind of went, went past but the most difficult thing about hell week is not the actual hell week is the perception of hell week like this will be the most difficult thing like you go scared as fuck and you've never been more scared in your whole life yeah. you don't know what you're going to face so looking back now we can say it was not the most difficult thing but like facing that the fear i never felt so much fear yeah. perhaps the the fear leading up to hell week is the most difficult but i think they trained us really well because throughout the the the, the four months prior to the hell week was emotionally painful so if i was to like compare that stress especially at the beginning when we're not used to that type of emotional stress i would i would say that was even more difficult than the hell week itself so i would say they trained us well for the psychological pressure of the hell week uh talking about wednesday which is the eight hours of torture uh for me it was a bit different from the others and um i think psychologically what helped me is before i went into the hell week my father was like when uh when they're like when they have you in the hell week just uh, always think in your mind like fuck you and that 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 should pull you through and i was always uh, because i had my father in mind and because i had that piece of advice in mind that's what i had throughout the the torture scenes and what made me laugh internally was 
that throughout the, the military process, they were always speaking to me in Greek. They made me do all my tests in Greek. And then when they came to the, the torture phase, so you had like the good, the bad, and the neutral uh, interrogators. When it came to the torture phase, they were speaking in English. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> to, that was humorous. <laughs> <laughs> to make you fail, like to make you understand all this stuff. Yeah, okay. but because I knew that they were doing that intentionally, <laughs> it made me feel as though like they're like trying to intentionally intimidate me. But because they were speaking in English on That's purpose fine. this time, now I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, you finished the first, fa first phase with the end of Hell Week. And uh, leading through the second phase, third phase, which is like all the people that were weak left and like people are staying that they probably will finish. And then it start becoming more serious. Like we're doing like diving stuff, like bombs, like yeah, shootings and like uh, good Navy SEAL training, like how everything led uh how did you fail through the next phases and like how also you was thinking about the trainers because the trainers, it's a big part of the Navy SEAL training. It's like the trainers are telling you what to do. So how was your relationship with them? You don't, you have zero relationship with your trainers in Navy SEAL, but you have kind of in your head a relationship with them. Yeah. yeah so each, each, everyone has their, yeah, kind of, the most difficult trainer, I guess, <laughs> but because um, all trainers they 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 like to train differently. But uh, during the second and third phase, I think it was more difficult uh, because mentally you know that you have a long way to go, and those were the months where it was a lot colder. So I think one of the, <laughs> the most cold came in place, baby. <laughs> so I think one of the most difficult things, <laughs> like for humans, actually, is, is the cold because if you're like. So, like so many hours in the water and then so many hours like your body is tired it could not produce 3 a.m in the winter okay boys let's go <laughs> your your legs they like they my, my my i have quite large legs so my legs were always tense they were always stressed out um like if you go like my my whole my whole body was always tense so uh there is a process like uh with waves all the team, all the Navy SEAL soldiers, they're getting like whatever, soldier to soldier, and then the waves are coming on you, and they hit you, and you are like you are laid on the on the beat on the cause. I don't know. Speak, say so, it in English so, so, because <laughs> I'm confused <laughs> in English to explain. It. And tell they were, me, they were always making fun of me because I couldn't say the word in Greek. So now I'm, <laughs> I guess <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> yeah. So the direct translation of what they call this when you're on the beach, you're lying directly towards the waves backwards. Uh, it's called moon therapy, where your head is almost submerged in the water, and the rest of your body is submerged in the water. And the whole process is basically the waves are, you're fully clothed and the waves are constantly um, coming onto you. So you're always getting fresh. In fresh. the cold winter. So you're in the cold winter, you're on the beach, you're lying against the waves and the waves are always like giving you a fresh sense of cold water. And a your fresh sense of cold water. You <laughs> what a what a beautiful way you put it. Such a beautiful <laughs> onomatopoeia way to put it in. But yeah, essentially you're, also getting seaweed like in, in your in your ears so i remember coming out of the army and going to the doctor and i had like something stuck in my ear and there was seaweed inside <laughs> so <laughs> yeah it's yeah i think it's one of the most it, it sounds uh it sounds a bit weird because you're just lying down but i think it was one of the most like difficult and cold experiences and you're there for hours like hours and hours on end and you know like I mean, David Goggins also talked about this in his in his book, like to be one of the most difficult processes because you're there for hours on end, and psychologically, you you just you feel like there's no end to it. Yeah, and those are the moments, the beautiful moments, that you kind of meet yourself, your true self. Yeah, I think that's when you truly realize like how how grateful you are to be be in a warm place. <laughs> but yeah very difficult very difficult <laughs> how was it for you was it the most difficult uh 
I, I was listening about the uh, Wim Hof when I was in the army, you did as well, I know. Yeah. So I was trying to take it as a challenge with Wim Hof, like yeah. getting a cold as fuck. And I was turning it, okay, it's kind of healthy for me. So they're doing me a favor to put me in this situation. So I was kind of reversing the table, but I'm not gonna lie. I was crying sometimes out of pain. <laughs> I mean, I was also interested in Wim Hof. I read his book and I was doing his breathing exercises in the army, thinking that they might help. They, they did not help at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After you finished the army, the eight months of training, how you fell, you felt internally, how everyone started treating you and how was it to be finally after eight months that you look up to this moment, how was the moment? So after, after you finish, it's like kind of like you don't really realize that you finish because everything is like normal all of a sudden. The trainers are not intimidating you. You're respected. You're, you're like, you're, you're just a normal person. You're a citizen again. So it's kind of a weird feeling, but uh, I can definitely say that we all cried when we threw off our helmets. Yeah, the moment, well, that was a beautiful moment. Like the, our, the head of the army of, of the Navy SEAL thing came and he said something emotional. You probably didn't understand in Greek. <laughs> he said like, and the, the, the head of Navy SEAL was crying as well. He said, you guys went through a lot of stuff. It's been eight months. Uh, nobody knows and nobody can understand what you went through. Only us and your trainers and it's time after eight months to throw your helmets up. Yeah. And we threw the helmets up and that was like the end of, when we finally can talk to our trainers because for eight months we couldn't talk to them normally. And yeah. it's like, it's uh, so emotional. This is the true pursuit of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? So for example, if you don't have water, when you drink water, you're like, you're so happy that you have water. So essentially it's like similar. If you're hungry and you eat food, you're happy. In this sense, you're like so restricted of everything and then you have something. So the emotions we felt were incredible, completely out of this world. And at this point, after we finished the army, I think this is the actual point where we actually started to become friends because we noticed that we're, we're both like motivated and because during the, the process of the training, we're kind of like, everyone is focused. Everyone doesn't really have a personality that much. But after when you finish the army, uh, that's when I started to realize like Phidias is a very motivated person. He likes similar stuff. He likes listening to books. And that's when we actually started becoming really good friends. It's crazy that in the whole eight months, we were not friends at all. Like no, no never talk intellectually or something like that. And it's like, because you don't have the time, guys. It's like, you're just following orders 24 seven. You don't have the time to talk with your peers. You don't have the time to do anything. Your only focus is selfishly to finish it. And the thing is like, after we finish, then everyone's true character unfolded because everyone was playing a game for eight months to just manipulate the trainers yeah. to like him and make him pass. Yeah, essentially that's when everyone's true personality came came to fold. Yeah, it's very interesting. But like, how did you feel? Like, you wanted that for eight months. How have uh, eight months uh, done? How everyone is treating you? You are now one of the most respected people in our society. You know, like everyone, if, you, if they know what, like in our country, if you say that you are from this part of the army, people go crazy. They are like, they immediately want to become your friends. They're like, oh my God, oh, you're crazy. It's like, how, is it? how was that? Maybe our team or other students, they care more about that. But for me, it was never about that. But there's definitely a big effect on how people view you. But I always wanted to, people to view me just for me. So I never really cared that much. But there was definitely a big impact. So. Can can you say that story with your friend that changed? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, essentially there was uh, some some people that were like in my school and some people that I knew, and they were always like looking down at me, making fun of me, and then they found out that I finished the 
the Navy SEALs, the military, and then they started texting me like as if they were my friend. And uh, I think you also experienced the same thing. It's crazy. <laughs> It's crazy how people, they, they treat you based on like, basically on on who who you are what you accomplished i think in the youtube world you kind of experience the same thing right yeah but it's kind of interesting it's, it's kind of useful as well you can uh, the way that people see you for example yesterday i went to take i lost my my passport because people stole it in the united states i have this video in this video here that i put the thumbnail and one person like i went there and there were He was, he knew it from YouTube, but it's the same thing from OIC if they know that you are from the Navy SEAL. And because I'm a YouTuber, he he treated me so good. He said, oh, he gave me his phone number. If you ever lose your passport, yeah, just send me a text. You get a different treatment from people and kind of useful, this treatment in a way. Did you find that you treatment useful? You don't even want it. You're like, fuck you guys. Uh, I never, uh, th they never really interested me. I don't really don't really care that much for me it was just i want to pass this for myself i want to pass this to prove my worth to my parents that was pretty much it i moved to the next thing and i think a good advice to take is like the navy seals although it's hard physically mentally it's just one part of your life to help you for the rest of your life i don't think it's good to be fixated and like put your whole life like this was the peak of your life i think i, I don't think it will be the peak of my life Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because there is some Navy SEALs that this is their whole life. They are 70 years old and they just speak about the thing that they, they did at 18. And they, can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, essentially, I think, I think our minds can naturally get kind of um, uh, lazy in a way. I, I, I always feel like as a man, you always have to fulfill your purpose. So there's always the next thing. So maybe you do something, you finish one thing, and then you have a different passion. You move on to that passion. And for me, that, that's exactly what it is. So I wanted to finish that. And then I wanted to provide for myself, provide for my family. I wanted to do something else. So that made me move on to my next passion. So essentially, I think it's it's good to have that. and But you have to use that as a tool. The whole point of going to the Navy SEALs for me was to have that as a tool for the rest of my life to, for example, when I am working on something else and I'm tired or mentally think that I cannot do it, that is a tool to allow me to do it anyways. So talk a bit more about that. How How is, is Navy SEAL useful now in your life? It's useful for me because whenever Except I- Except that you have me in your life. <laughs> Except for having videos in my life. <laughs> Uh, it's useful because if I ever have any limits uh, physically, I know that I can push them. And mentally, I think the biggest difference, what and I think what other people notice a lot, and what I saw in the beginning of the Navy, like being in the Navy SEALs and what I kind of wanted from that, is that at the beginning of the training, I always saw the trainers as like very calm and like very, they, like nothing can really phase them. They're never like emotionally stressed. And I think that's the biggest impact it had on me. So no matter what happens, I'm not like emotionally stressed. I can over overcome it. I can always be calm. I think a lot of people, they notice that in my demeanor when I talk. So they don't feel as though I'm stressed or they don't feel as though something phases me, even though when something drastically terrible is happening in that moment. Very interesting. So I want to, uh, guys, uh, Nick, is the reason that I even had some relationship with girls in my life. <laughs> Because we finished the army and we started going out together. And like Nick had one very interesting passion back then. Like it was your passion to kind of explain that. What was your passion with girls? Like to go and like make relationship with girls and like, this dynamic of like finding a girl and like making li her like you and all this stuff. What was your passion back then? Explain it a bit more. So essentially, um, when I was younger, I was very, I, am, I still am, I'm very introverted. So socializing and trying to understand the world and trying to understand social situations, that became my, my biggest interest when I was younger. And that interest came also after when I finished the army. I think after a couple of months, you realize, okay, you come back to your normal self. 
And essentially, my interests were to be better at social interactions, to be better at talking with people. And being an 18-year-old, your main interest is women. So my interest was, of course, <laughs> getting better at talking with women because I was not good at that part of my, my life. And uh, it's cool that I was able to, for example, help Fidias with uh, that side for him because he never really had uh, any success with women in his life. And he wanted that like success at that point of his life. He wanted to go through that phase. Yeah, and basically it was normal things. He was like, okay, just go and talk with you. I, I was like the most bravest person ever. And like when he was coming to speak to a girl, I was like... Ugh. So basically for extroverts, it's super easy to, for example, have success with friends and making having a girlfriend. But for me, it was something very difficult because I was so much more of an introvert. I couldn't really speak. I had social anxiety. And then... I, through that, I converted Fidias into also going out of his comfort zone and having more success. So it's like simple, simple rules to be like more, uh, more confident. Tell them, baby. Tell the rules. Uh, I said basic things to Fidias to be more confident, to try more times to to speak with women, to have more. I think it's more internal. So, like perhaps. Uh, you don't feel as though you're worthy of like speaking to a woman to getting a relationship with a woman. So essentially it was all social, social, uh, social, um, like men mental, mental strategies to be better in that area of your life. And it's like every other skill, right? Yeah. I mean, of course, the more you do something, the more better you are at it. If you're a more social person, that's just much more easier for you. But if you're someone that's not so social, then it's it's very difficult. It can be the most difficult thing in the world to speak to a girl. Yeah. Why do you think so many people struggled with this uh, topic? Like I was struggling. And if I didn't meet you properly, I was going to st still be struggling. I think it's a sense of a sense of worth, perhaps. I think it's mostly internal. So we feel as though we don't deserve uh, to be with that person. Uh, so it's good. Although like the goal was just to, for example, have a girlfriend or have a girl in your life, like going through that process kind of helps you in other areas because you know that it's not the main purpose in your life, but at the same time you, you go through certain situations which kind of bring you out of your comfort zone. So it, it's good to go through that process to... Because it can help you in other areas of your life. What is an advice that you give to people that they want to approach girls and like they want to become better in this uh, aspect? How to get a girlfriend, how to have sex with women and all this stuff. I don't think there's an easy way. It's like a process. Just be yourself and over... Be yourself. Try to not put so much pressure on yourself, no matter what you say. And also go with like the natural process. Like a lot of guys, they think, oh, they're outcome biased. They think, oh, I have to be with this person. But like think to yourself, do you actually like this person? Do you actually enjoy spending time with this person? Or is your mind just so set on being with this person physically or mentally? So just be yourself and naturally the right person will come along. Yeah, I, I agree with it. Like I made some, like some, sometimes like the girl is so beautiful and like, you're like, you put in your mind that you really want to or, or, or approach her, have sex with her. And it's like, actually, you don't even like to spend time with her. I think in area, any area, in anything that you do in life, you just have to make mistakes. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Do like, if you, if that's what you really want at this point in your life, then if you want to go through that phase, then talk to more girls, just be more social uh, do just do it more. The more you do it, the more comfortable that you're going to become doing it. And no matter what happens, don't like be outcome irrelevant. So no matter what happens, like it doesn't matter. Like you're still alive in one month, one day, no one's going to really care. I think the main thing which kind of helps us in a lot of other areas of our lives, like we think people care. People don't care. They don't care about you. They only care about themselves. So like no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. 
So try to, and it's, it's, I think it's, I think the biggest difference between like men in their twenties and men in their thirties is like in their twenties, they think everyone cares. And like, because humans are social creatures, we think, oh, what does everyone think about us? And then if you compare a lot of men in their thirties or forties, when they, they realized like nobody cares, then they start to actually truly living their lives. So I think that's the, probably the main thing that I took from this and that you took from this is that you start living your life. You start doing things, you start being more conscious. You, if you want to do something in life, then you, you do it and you just make the mistake to do it. You don't really care what other people think about you. And when you are not needy, it's a lot more attractive. And when you don't care, actually don't care, then it becomes... Of course, even in the business sense, if you're coming off as too needy, then people feel it. Uh, one of my favorite books is Pitch Anything, and he goes into like the human brain and the psychology of it. And essentially, like we feel like other people when they communicate to us. We feel as though if they're needy, and that's the most unattractive sign, and we want to get far away from it as possible. Our brain has like an emotional response, like this this person is unstable. So essentially, yeah, being needy in any sense, a friendship or a relationship or uh, speaking with a girl or speaking with a potential business partner, it's the worst thing you could do. What is uh, your relationship? So when I met you, you were listening videos on YouTube about pickup artists and like how to game, whatever, girls and like, uh, and I think you had a kind of a transition phase like uh, in your life, which you, what is your opinion about all this pickup stuff? I think if you're, I think, of course, if you're, if that's what you want to do in, if, if, if that's the area you want to get in better in your life, like, so pick up stuff is like the small, the small tips that someone would give you. So for example, make, talk to a girl, talk to five girls a day, for example, or talk to three girls a day, like the, the small tips within the whole general brand of getting better in that area of your life. I think if if you want to by, bypass that phase of course do do that of course but uh in general for me as a person my transition i didn't really see that much importance in that area of my life so i transitioned and worked more towards my purpose which i think everyone should do and i think if you work towards your purpose then it's more fulfilling and the right girl right person will come along because if you follow this pickup community and you try to focus too much on that then then you're you're moving away from your purpose and i think that's the most attractive thing that you can get from a woman so a woman is attracted to a man that's on their purpose that's what i believe so don't be too fixated on on that do it like for a certain period of time just so you can get rid of that social anxiety so you can feel worth uh you can feel the worth of of doing those things but of course transfer that energy and focus on your purpose so Focusing on your purpose is more attractive. Yeah, of course. I think if you're a man that's on their on their journey and you're just someone that's like has one focus in in their life, that's just way more way more attractive. And uh, so 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 it's a natural process. You need to go and try these things, the pick up stuff, and then you understand. Maybe that's not the meaning you know, of everything. But as a person that you have so so many relationships with girls in your life, so many. And like at, at the point of your life, it was your only focus, like to just become good at it or understand this dynamic. You were doing it as well as, as studying it, but like, did you found any meaning into those relationships, into meeting those girls, into the interactions of those girls? Uh, you, you speak now and you seem that you've had more meaning through your the purpose of your life. Can you t tell me about how that process did that made you feel worthy or that you were having relationships with girls? T talk to me about this. Um, I think it doesn't really make you feel worthy. I mean, being 18, you might want to go through that process of trying and being in many different, uh, having different relationships, different uh, interactions with women. If you want to, like, I think if you want to do that, you shouldn't like listen to other people. You should try it for yourself and then realize for yourself. Like if, if you think money is not the reason for, for life, don't, 
like if you think money is the reason for life try it make money and then if you realize later on that it's not the re reason for life uh that's okay but because you did it yourself it's i, I think humans are people that you have to do things yourself to realize and yeah for me that was that process helped me understand like that's not really what i'm that's that's not really the the meaning of life that's not really the purpose but the skills were transferable to everything else you do in life so it's it's basically when you're in that that age you're figuring out your self-worth you're figuring out uh actually what you wanted to do so at that age i didn't actually know what i wanted to do in my life so no like be but being better socially being better in interactions that definitely helped me in other areas of my life to create my first business to uh, do other things so you're basically saying that it that it didn't fulfill you at the end of the day, but you needed to go through that phase to figure it out yourself that this is not kind of the point in my life. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you if there's something that that you want in life, you have to try it yourself. Those um, being out in 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 that situation and for example, feeling that I'm I'm worthy enough in that situation. I think that just that's just the part of figuring life out. That's the part of uh, f figuring everything out. Just figure everything out for for yourself. Be more uh, look look at yourself. Be alone and like consciously think where you want to get to in the next couple of years and try to and, and uh, always have worth for yourself. So, how is it like? traveling like you for you like you travel to some places and like your your we travel some places together how i think i know that traveling is a big part of your life and you want to explore cultures and all this stuff so what does how how did how is this part of your life so ever since i was a kid uh, i remember even since when i was seven years old uh, you could ask my sister she would say like i was always telling telling my parents and my sister that I wanted to travel. So I wasn't exactly sure how I would make that in my life, but through manifesting and visualizing that since a young age, that's became my reality. So as soon as I was 18, I started traveling and I started working a normal job. And I like, I went through that, that process and through that learning process, because when you're at that, that age, when you just figuring out what you wanted to do, what you want to do in life, I was figuring out what I wanted to do in life. And Traveling was like learning for me because I was going to different places, like seeing different people, uh, making kind of friends in different different areas. I think uh, also Matthew McConaughey did this in his book Green Light. He was a student exchange. He went to a completely different country, and Australia. He, he went to Australia from America, and then he basically lived with completely different family. And I think that's what opens up our minds. So for me, as as someone that is figuring out their purpose, figuring out their their life, traveling and going to different areas and opening up your mind is very important. How how friendships affected your life? How what I know that this is a big part of your life. Like you, it's social interaction. It's not Nick is not only interested in girls, and he was he's all it's interested in social interactions like dynamics and you are very good at like for example meeting a youtuber and like feel you feel that you are enough and you're not like and the other person understands that you are cool as well like without having whatever 10 million followers and all this stuff so but how everything like uh, how you is the relationships with people in your life and friends and how do you choose to have some people in your life so for me, I'm an introvert. I like to have a few friends in my life, but good ones. So Phidias is my my best friend. And then I have some other friends, which I like to hang out with. Uh, for me, how I see friends is the people that you surround yourself with that becomes your life, that becomes everything for you. So like the five, the top five people are your, your income. The top five people are who you are. I think it's kind of the only way we can kind of hack and change our lives, the people we have around us, the things that we feed to our minds. So I would rather be alone than with someone that like doesn't fulfill me in that way. So I'm listening to books, I'm reading books that, that feeds my, my mental, my mental state. And at the same time, I'm surrounded by people with good energy, surrounded by people with, with ambitions, surrounded by people that basically they, they get, they give to your life th through, 
they feed your mind. That's I think the most important thing you can do in life. It's interesting. I, do you feel that the people that you have around you is like maybe the meaning of life? Perhaps, yeah. If there was a meaning to life, yeah, then perhaps it is. There is no meaning in life. <laughs> I I'm not sure how to answer that question. Maybe I need to think about it. Like, but I need like a couple of years to get back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so you started being interested in content creation the last uh, couple of months and years, and I'm curious to, for example, you are a successful person in the way that you did the Navy SEAL. And like now you're just start choosing an area you want to make videos and all this stuff and become a YouTuber. How is that struggle? How does that affect your confidence? And like how is how is beginning? So last year, uh, the last couple of years for me was um, were super interesting because there were a lot of growth because I had to, for example, make money. Uh, with my business, I decided to quit my job and go full time into filmmaking, full time into photography, full time into uh, making videos, and that's how I how I made uh, how I made my money so far. And uh, it's something nice because I have passion into creating creating videos, creating photos. So I never really feel like I'm working. Um, at the same time. Uh, that's kind of converting, like you said. I'm also trying many different things. Uh, I'm trying YouTube right now, and I think I'm kind of like comfortable. I don't really mind that much in the videos that I post. Like I'm not so proud in the videos I post, but at the same time, I know that like after a hundred videos, that that's gonna get better. So I think the whole learning process in the last two years, speaking with clients, speaking with uh, like selling myself. I think that definitely selling himself. Yeah, <laughs> that, I think that definitely br- brought me the the comfort of trying other things like YouTube now. So it's difficult uh, to upload every week. It's kind of difficult. Yeah. I so how? Say. So I was we were together in one month ago, and I was speaking with Nigga, and I was telling, bro, if you want to become a YouTuber, you have to. Uh, your first hundred videos will suck, so just get them out of the way. Yeah. It's so, super interesting because I, I when he told me, okay, you have to upload a week video once a week, I had so much resistance. I was like, no, I don't want to upload a video once a week. I have to be perfect. And uh, then I, I have to like upload a story on Instagram that I, I'm uploading every week. And I had resistance to that. So even though I thought that I didn't care what other people think about it, think about me, internally, I kind of did. So I guess when the, the best idea wins, when you have good friends around you to push you in certain areas of your life then <laughs> it was very funny you end me. up doing it <laughs> that, that that discussion i was talking with nigga we were like i was telling bro come on you have to upload once a week there is not even if you are going to become the biggest youtuber in the world your first videos will suck and you have to go through making mistakes and all this stuff he was like no, I feel like maybe once a month <laughs> I will upload. I want to make things good and perfect. Like, yeah. And, and now after four weeks or something, I'm, yeah, he uploaded three videos. He's going to upload another one. Uh, now go check his YouTube channel out. He's going to be evolved in process. And Yeah, next year we're going to be a very interesting evolving process because I'll be uploading frequently. And I'm also in a lucky position to be surrounded by other YouTubers. So I have Phidias as my mentor here. And I also have another friend who's a travel filmmaker. His, Shout out to just Kai. His name is Kai. We made like some videos before and now we're planning to move together in a studio and make yeah. Talk like, about that. You want to move to Portugal, right? Uh, yeah. So essentially the idea is to move to Portugal, kind of build like a creator house, perhaps bring other people in the future. But um, yeah, spend our time surfing and having like creating videos, helping each other film videos. And uh, I think that's like a, so with hacking your life, the people you have around you and putting yourself in environments where you cannot really fail. So if you put yourself in an environment where you're surrounded by other creators, surrounded by other filmmakers, and like you're only there for the purpose of creating videos, then you kind of force yourself in a scenario where you have to you have to make it's videos. So important. This is how I became a YouTuber as well. Arak. I was around Arak yeah. for uh, like a year, and he helped me understand stuff. He helped me with 
my videos and stuff. So, and I saw him most importantly making his videos. And it's like, this is the best learning ever. And then I saw Mr. Peace doing his videos and like, I had the best learning from the best of the world. So yeah, yeah this is just the process, just uh, by being around. But I, I like what you said before, is the maybe the only way to change our behavior and to achieve our goals, yeah. to manipulate ourselves to our PR. Perhaps group. it's not the only way, but it's definitely the easiest way. For example, if you don't buy chocolates at the store, you never eat them at the house. So like you kind of force yourself to succeed. Yeah. And when you are around all these people, it's like, when you are around, for example, Eric and Mr. Beast, you know, it's like, obviously you're going to learn and make your own yeah. stuff. Stuff so it's like a no-brainer. If you can get yourself through, be what a friend with me as a YouTuber, yeah. that will be kind of and this. But it's kind of interesting. But you, for example, you don't need to add whatever value to my life to to be my friend. Like we're already friends for like five six years. So, but I think there is a dynamic there. For example, maybe you feel it with just Kai. It needs to be some form of a change of value in this situation. Yeah, I think one of the biggest skills, which I think you also have is perhaps from the books that we were reading before is to how to give value to people that are like where you want to be or like much higher level than you are in that specific area. So for example, YouTube. And I think the main thing is like to give value to others. Yeah, because they, they, nobody cares about you. They care about everyone that cares about themselves. So it sucks. You always got to figure out a way to, how, how can you make it easy for that person to be in your life? How can you make it easy for that person to say yes, for example? Yes. So that's just like, you have to think creatively, Very how can I be valuable skill. to that person? If you come to them and you ask, okay, how can I be of value to them? Then you're already taking value from them because they have to think for you. How, how how are they this person gonna give value to, yeah, to yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. I had a lot of subscribers coming to me when I was doing the Elon Musk and they were just wanted to be my friends. So they were like thinking about stuff and they were just asking oh, how I can help you, like I want to help you, like please. And it's like it's <laughs> bro, it's just like every, every, everyone is trying to become your friend. Like imagine when you are Mr. Beast. It's like everyone is trying to become your friend. You have everything. But so. if, for example, someone were to you were to think exactly what you need and be like, "Yo, I have a car for you. Yo, I have this for you. Can I bring it to you?" Yeah, then it's for, like a bit different because yeah. you make it more easier for someone to say yes. Yes, and for example, Mr. Beast has needs over time. He is going to make a chocolate bar, and he wants to promote it. So if you promote it, and like promote it, like there is some some stuff opportunities that you can see and identify. Like what I did with Eric, like I saw him for one year uh, that he was uh, he gained one million subscribers, and I was like, oh shit, this guy is in need of characters and people in his team now. So I'm going to tell him to be one year for uh, to tell him to be in his videos for free, and that was kind of a big thing for him, a big help. So I added value in the best way possible. So. You made it hard for him to say no to you because it was yeah. so so beneficial for his videos to have you as a character in his videos. And then over time, like his audience started loving you. So it was- And then he didn't have a choice. <laughs> then he didn't have a choice. No. <laughs> because the- <laughs> it's funny, but uh, we are both lovers of learning. And philosophy. I think and, that's why we relate to them. I think that's why we're friends. And with philosophy and all this stuff. What is the rule of, uh, what is the role of learning in your life and philosophy and like these big philosophical discussions about free will, about death, about everything? Like, what does this uh, topic play a role in your life? So for me. I'm so bad at English. I love it. I love you guys. <laughs> for, for me, everything learning kind of really brings happiness because everything I always feel as though there's something bigger to, to life, but then again, just learning just really makes me fulfilled and happy because everything else like eating food and like, I don't know, uh, other pleasures in life, they're just kind of pleasures, but like learning really makes you think and really makes you interested and really stimulates your, your mind. I think that's probably the, the main, uh, 
the main interest I have in life. That's for me. But everyone's uh, everyone's life is different. They may how did you things. got into these learning things? So for me, le- learning was always important. I think uh, le- f- f- the first things that uh, and we're talk- not talking about school, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first things that brought me into learning was being like a young person, maybe like around thirteen. I was like very introverted. I couldn't really. Um, I wasn't really confident in myself. So that process of trying to be more confident in myself, that process of trying to understand the world around me, that kind of brought me into, okay, I'm a person that is, okay, confident enough in himself, confident enough to speak to others. And then that boosted like a whole another era of, okay, I want to learn more. I want to learn about this. I want to learn about different areas. I think that's what kickstarted it for me. I didn't really understand social scenarios. I didn't really understand society, the world, and I wanted to know more about it. So that's what learning was for me. That's what really. And now, me. what, what role? This is how you started, but like now it's became all your fucking life of learning. You only care about learning now. So like, how is how is, yeah. So why? initially, I think it's like a perhaps a level of energy. So initially, it's like you want to learn to make your life better. So you want to learn to have more money. You want to learn in order to have more friends. And then learning becomes more like spiritual, becomes, at least for me, it became more spiritual, more philosophical. Like, is that really the the purpose? Is that really the, the, the thing that I the things that I want in life? So it it I think that's the the main shift for me. So I love learning about ma- many different things, have many different interests. So I have uh a confession to make bro we had so many beautiful memories together like fucking hell <laughs> it's like I, I look back on, on our life and it's like we sneaked out of the army like we did so we traveled together we did so many crazy stuff together which is so beautiful like this is what life is about and when you look back to our friendship and all the memories it's kind of super beautiful yeah, one thing I can say for sure is that my friendship with Fidias, it's like kind of one of a kind. Perhaps not everyone has this type of relationship and well, I'm kind very of lucky. very yeah, lucky. Very and, I, lucky. and I was saying like a couple of times, like I wouldn't trade this relationship for like billions of dollars. Like it's something so unique and so specific that I don't think everyone has like such a close relationship. I don't think it happens so often. It only happened once for me. I don't know how that process came around. But uh, yeah, definitely very lucky to have uh, Phidias in my life because it's such a beautiful experience that we can have friendship that formulates over years and then have many beautiful memories as well. And now we started sucking each other's dick. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to say thank you. I love you, Nick, for being in my life. And like I think probably one of the meaning of life or uh, my life is the friendships that I have. Fuck, uh, fuck all their stuff. Like, them is the f- purpose that making videos and all this stuff. And the second best thing in my life is just the relationships that I have with my friends. Thank you for having me, bro. I look forward to having you on my podcast. Yes. I love you guys. Thank the you. The true for- story of Phidias. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you for watching. And yeah. Okay, li- bye. Life is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>